All right, looks like we've got some folks rolling in to join us this evening, some other people who are uh, logging in to join us for the webinar. Um, but with it being six o'clock, we'll go ahead, we'll kick it off for this evening um, and get started. So I just wanna say a good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I wanna welcome you to our 2023 um, CRP or Conservation Reserve Program webinar. Um, we're excited to have everybody here tonight as we talk about some of our um, CRP basics. We're gonna cover some of those really quick. Um, and then we're gonna go over some updates for the um, current general signup and some new things that are happening with CRP. Um, I'm Kim Cole. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever in Missouri. Um, so I'm going to kind of be our host tonight and help moderate tonight's session. Um, but we do have two presenters with us um, for our webinar tonight. We've got uh, Will Robinson and Heather Jones. Um, both of those are uh, Farm Bill biologists here on the Missouri Quail Forever team. Um, they've got a lot of good information to share about CRP. Um, so we're going to try to go through some um, basics real quick, some other information with everybody tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it over to both of them in just a minute um, to introduce themselves a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I want to um, just share a few housekeeping things, mention a few things with everybody. Um, so you can kind of see those on your screen right now. Uh, but I just wanted to let folks know we are recording um, the presentation this evening, and we're going to make that available um, afterwards. It's going to be on our Missouri Quill Forever YouTube page. Um, and then we're also going to send a link out um, to everybody that registered. So anybody who registered for the webinar tonight, you're going to um, um, receive a link for the recording when we get done. Um, I also want to let you know your microphones are muted and your cameras are off. Um, so in tonight's webinar setting, you can just see us as your speakers and just hear us as your speakers. Um, so you won't be able to um, see or hear you all. So you'll be able to just sit back um, and relax and listen in as we talk about CRP. Um, and then since everyone is uh, muted, since your microphones are muted, if you do have questions during the webinar, um, we ask that you um, put those down into the Q&A feature. So you can kind of see that image there of the Q&A um, box. So as you have a, a question, put that into that Q&A feature. Um, we'll try to answer some of those during the presentation um, while our speakers are talking, and then we'll probably um, answer some of those live at the end as well. Um, we'll discuss a few of those. So um, just a few things for folks to keep in mind tonight. Um, but now I'm going to go ahead um, and turn it over to Heather and Will. I'm going to let them introduce themselves really quickly um, before they start their presentation. So Heather, I'll turn it over to you and let you guys go from there. All right. Thank you, Kim. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Heather Jones. I'm the Farm Bill Wildlife Biologist in the northeast corner of Missouri, the far corner. Um, I cover Clark, Lewis, Knox, and Scotland counties. And I'm going to pass it over to Will to get us going. Yeah, thanks, Heather. I'm Will Robinson. I'm a Farm Bill Wildlife Biologist, also in the northeast part of the state. I cover Shelby, Marion, and Monroe counties. Um, Thank you all for joining us. And like Kim said, if you have any questions, throw them in the Q&A and, and we'll try to answer them to the best of our abilities. So today we are gonna talk about um, the CRP program introduction and need, some things that go along with eligibility and enrollment, soil rental, rental rates, uh, and then continuous CRP, general CRP, and some management of CRP. What is CRP? CRP stands for Conservation Reserve Program. It was started in 1985 with the purpose of addressing environmental concerns associated with agricultural landscape. Farmers enrolled in the program agreed to remove environmentally sensitive land from agricultural production and plant species that improve environmental health and quality. This is one of the largest private lands conservation program in the United States and the technical assistance so the plan writing and uh, things like that come from the Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS, as well as the Missouri Department of Conservation and Quail Forever. What are the benefits of CRP? Well, there are several, beginning with soil erosion. Soil erosion can be a, a problem all across the state, and when it gets like it is in the picture, it can be hard to farm those acres. Uh, and they're also not, not as profitable with that topsoil washing away. So seed planting grasses and forbs into fields like that can boost profitability with the rental rates, as well as uh, conserve the ground, improve soil health, and get that field back into a farmable condition. Runoff from fields also poses a, a huge problem in, in some areas, uh, as, as uh, it depletes topsoil, as well as in introducing chemicals, 
and spoil into our into our waterways. So there are CRP programs that can help address that. Odd areas is one that you see in, in parts of the state. Small fields or narrow fields can be hard to farm. Uh, if your turn rows are super narrow, those can be a challenge to farm. And there are CRP programs that can help you square up those fields, make them easier to farm, and uh, decrease input costs because you're not farming as many acres. Field edges is a big one. Not only can trees shade out the edges of your crops, um, but it can also, uh, your, your, oftentimes the crops on the edge of the field aren't as productive as in the middle of the field. As we see in this picture, the corn on the left was on the edge of the field and the corn on the right was much better and that came from the middle of the field. So taking those field edges out of production can boost your profitability. Um, with today's technology, we can see, are you farming in the red? Precision agriculture has taken leaps and bounds over the last few years um, to produce maps like this that can show farmers profitability. On this map, the blue acre is profitable and the red acres are the acres that, that may be losing some money or, or barely breaking even. So knowing that it can help producers make the informed decision to take some of the acres out of production and put them into CRP. Which leads us to one of my favorite sayings, which is farm the best, conserve the rest. One way to do that is by signing up for CRP. Currently, we are in continuous sign up 59 as well as general sign up 60. The general sign up ends on April 7th, which is just in a few weeks. Um, some of the main differences between continuous and general CRP are that uh, continuous primarily focuses on those buffer or field edge practices, as well as smaller whole field acreage. Um, so typically you won't see a whole farm enrolled in continuous CRP. Continuous CRP is non-competitive, but does require a suitability and feasibility determination to make sure that the practice is applicable on the acres that are being offered. It's an ongoing signup. Um, you can apply and enroll anytime during the year. The contracts always have to start on the first of the month um, and the seeding can be deferred. So you can't start a continuous contract when there are still crops in the field, but that seeding can be deferred until the crops are gonna be out of the field. Uh, many of the practices can be offered in 10 or 15 year contracts. And like we talked about, uh, with the precision egg stuff, it's a great option for unprofitable acres. Your general CRP practices are typically whole field practices. They are competitive, so not everybody is guaranteed to get in. And what they use to compare them is what we call the environmental benefits index, which takes in a bunch of different factors. And then your offer is compared against all the offers nationally and they usually set a cutoff score. And if your offer is higher than that score, your offer is accepted. Most of the practices are 10-year contracts that will start on October 1st of 2023. So now that I've got you roped into signing up for CRP, you may be wondering how do you submit an offer? There are a few things you have to think about before you submit an offer. Have you owned the land for 12 months? and had the ground that you're offering, the acreage you've been offering, has that been cropped for four of the six years between 2012 and 2017? There are a few exceptions to owning it for 12 months. Um, the cropland also cannot be currently enrolled in CRP, or it cannot be currently enrolled in other federal programs. If it is currently enrolled in CRP, that CRP must expire in September of this year. Soil rental rates are based on the productivity of each of the soils within the county and the average cash rent of that county. For general CRP, the, uh, the soil rental rate is set at 85% of the county rental rate. For continuous, it's set at 90% of that county rental rate. There are some other incentives associated with individual practices um, that could apply. To, bol to bolster that rental rate, and there is also cost share on new CRP seedings. Some of the continuous sign-up options are uh, filter strips. Filter strips are a great practice that can be used along seasonal or perennial streams, permanent lakes and ponds, and most wetlands, 
filter strips are a great option for stabilizing stream banks that may run along the edge of crop fields. Um, the CP21 practice, that's the practice code for filter strips, includes a high diversity seeding of native grasses, uh, wildflowers or forbs, and legumes. These plants provide excellent wildlife habitat, but they also all have extensive root systems that when established will help slow the erosion from creeping into your crop field more than it already is. The wetland restoration practice is a really neat practice um, that can take some of the wetter acres that in this picture, you know, you're not going to grow beans in a puddle of water. You can offer some of the wet acres into this CP23. The offer has to include a minimum of 51% hydric soils. And as you can on the screen, it says a three to one ratio of upland to wetland habitat. So if you have an acre of wetland, you can enroll three acres as a buffer around that wetland. This is also going to include a high diversity mix of native warm season grasses, cool season grasses, and forbs that are best suited for wet areas. So not only will it provide that wildlife habitat, but you will have something that can thrive in those wet conditions and stabilize the soil, improve soil health. Um, it's a win-win. Habitat buffers are one of my personal favorite practices. They were designed specifically with quail habitat in mind. These, this is a great practice to do um, field edges. You can go all the way around the field. Um, However, there do have to be breaks for getting in and out of the field with farm machinery. Um, and the middle of the field still has to be cropped. So every year there has to be a crop planted that borders the CP33, which is the practice code for habitat buffers. Um, the habitat buffers are going to include, again, a, a high diversity seeding of native warm season grasses and forbs, which provide excellent quail habitat. Native forbs are um, really beneficial for brood rearing habitat. They provide kind of an umbrella effect to screen young quail from aerial predators. And the native warm season grasses are imperative for a lot of grassland bird species, quail, turkey, and, and many others for nesting habitat. Not only will you do this high, high diversity planting, but there is a woody component associated with CP33s and edge feathering uh, or shrub plantings will have to be completed. And those both provide excellent escape cover for small game. Prairie strips is another buffer practice. It's very similar to the CP33 and the seed mix is gonna look very similar. The big difference with prairie strips is that they can also run through the middle of the field. So not only can they border the field, but if you have a waterway or a bad spot of erosion running through the field, these are a great option for taking the, that small strip of acreage out of the middle of the field and putting in a CP43 or prairie strip. They are a little bit dependent on the ecological site description. Um, if the ground was historically a prairie, you may have to buy yellow tag seed, which is source, the source and origin will have to be in Missouri. If it wasn't historically a prairie, just use regular seed. But again, it's going to be a mix of those native bunch grasses and wildflowers. And there is no woody component with the CP43. This year, there is also a 20% incentive um, offered nationally that will boost your rental rate 20% if you opt to enroll in a CP43. Um, these are a great option. If you're interested in taking some field borders, or like I said, strip through the middle of your field uh, out of production. Pollinator habitat um, is also a really cool practice. I, I just like native habitat, so I think these are all pretty cool. Uh, it's going to be a similar seeding with the native forbs and wildflowers. Um, it's going to, and it can be offered as a general or continuous practice. If you offer it as a continuous practice, the offer cannot exceed 10 acres of CP42 per tract or 10% of the cropland acres on the farm. So if, if, the, if the farm is 90 acres, then it max out at 10 or nine acres. Um, this is again, a, a great, great practice for wildlife benefits in Missouri. Not only are we gonna be producing quality bird habitat, deer habitat, 
but it's also good pollinator habitat. Uh, as the name of the practice suggests. It's going to include a high diversity mix of at least 20 wildflowers. Um, and once it's established, it's also gonna look really pretty. So if there's some small acreages around your house or odd ends of a field, and you wanna have this as a showpiece, that's an option as well. SAFE or CP38 is a continuous CRP practice that again was designed with um, some of the struggling species in Missouri in mind, specifically the bobwhite quail and the monarch. Um, it's going to include a similar planting like we've been talking about with uh, native, native wildflowers and grasses. It's also going to include uh, a milkweed component for uh, the monarchs if, if you opt to go that route. Um, the CP38 4D is permanent wildlife habitat. And what that's going to do is it's going to give wildlife, everything they need in one field. There's a food plot component, as well as a shrub planting component and possibly some edge feathering that will go along with your seeding. So we've talked about the nesting and the broodering habitat. The shrubby component and the edge feathering will provide that escape cover as well as thermal cover for these small birds when it gets cold in the winter. Um, so it's, it's a really cool practice. If you are a wildlife minded person, um, this may be a good route for you to go. These are the counties where the CP38 safe Northern Bob White Monarch habitat is currently offered. So there is um, most of Southern Missouri or the middle of Southern Missouri, I should say, is not eligible for this. But if you're in any of the yellow counties and you're interested, talk to the folks in your local FSA office and they can help you get signed up. Another CP38 safe option is the Missouri Sand Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, and you can use this in any of the counties listed on the screen to restore sand prairies, uh, sand woodlands, sand savannas, any of those sand ecosystems. Um, only specific watersheds with identified sandy soils within the counties listed on the screen are eligible. So that's another one you'll have to check with FSA for your eligibility. This year, the Missouri Department of Conservation has offered some new continuous CRP enhancement incentives. So if you're going to do any of those safe practices and your farm is located in one of the red areas on the screen, you may be eligible for some extra money from the conservation department. Uh, that map is a little bit hard to see where those red, red areas are. So if you have questions about eligibility, you can talk to your local Missouri Department of Conservation PLC or your local Farm Bill biologist. If you have questions about any of these CRP practices, what they may entail, or if you don't know which one is right for you, you can also reach out to your local PLC or Farm Bill Biologist or your local NRCF as NRCS office, and we can help point you in the right direction. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to throw it over to Heather to talk about some general CRP practices. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Will. I'm going to get my screen switched and... We're gonna shift gears and we are gonna start talking about a uh, general CRP signup. Um, as a reminder, um, like Will mentioned, uh, we are currently in the general CRP signup window right now um, and it closes on April 7th. Um, and these are typically our whole field practices. Um, and again, it is a competitive program uh, where applications are ranked nationally against other participants. Um, and we'll briefly touch on that ranking system in a few slides. Um, in addition to the ownership and cropping history requirements for all CRP contracts that Will kind of touched on earlier, uh, general CRP has some additional requirements um, of a, a property must have a weighted erosion index of eight or higher. Um, there are some certain situations where that erosion requirement is waived, for example, if the acreage uh, is an expiring CRP or it's uh, located in the national or state conservation priority areas uh, indicated on this map in red. Um, just to briefly touch on the uh, ranking aspect of general CRP, it can get kind of complicated, so we're just going to briefly uh, talk about that. Um, each application is given an EBI score or an environmental benefits index uh, score. 
Um, and that overall score comes from several different factors. And very few of those factors can be directly influenced by landowner choice. Um, some of those factors are scored, scored based on soil type or location. So you have no influence over that. Um, but one factor that landowners do have um, a choice on is their seed mix choice with whatever practice it is that they're enrolling in. Um, and that seed, seed mix choice can influence their overall EBI score. And we'll kind of talk about that when we talk about these different um, general CRP practices. Um, so CP1, this is our permanent introduced grasses. Um, I am gonna touch on several different um, conservation practices, and these are not exclusive to general CRP signup. I do want to note that these are available during the continuous CRP uh, signup um, for highly erodible land. So um, if you are curious about that, definitely reach out to your local FSA office. Um, and if you missed this general CRP signup window, but you are interested in any of these practices, you can reach out and see if you're eligible during that continuous um, time frame. Um, so for CP1, this is our permanent introduced grasses and legumes. Um, as a landowner, you have a choice between a 40-point mix and a 10-point mix. Um, that point value is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to go towards your overall EBI score uh, or environmental benefits uh, index score. So the 40-point mix uh, is a little bit more diverse than the 10-point mix. Um, and I do want to note that anytime there's a FORB component, um, that FORB component must meet or must have a minimum of 20 native FORB species uh, within the mix um, if it calls for FORBs. Um, another general CRP practice is our CP2, our permanent native grasses. Um, with this, uh, landowners have an option between a 50 point mix and a 20 point mix. Uh, the 50 point mix includes three native uh, native grass species, um, and those species are listed there, as well as a forb component. Um, the 20 point mix includes two native grass species, so a little bit more diverse with the 50 point mix, um, and again, having uh, include your forb um, species as well. Another practice is our CP25, which is our rare and declining habitat restoration. So um, these seed mixtures, it, it's based off the historical plant community. So working with FSA and our NRCS, um, you can they can help you determine uh, whether you are um, in need of a tall grass prairie or savanna um, seed mix. Um, and those are both 50 point mixes. So high quality uh, habitat for wildlife with both of these. And the species vary a little bit depending on which um, habitat or historical plant community you're restoring. Um, I do wanna note too with this one, uh, work with your seed vendors if you are work, uh, signing up for this practice. Um, work with your seed vendor because this is also one of those practices that uh, Missouri source identified class seed or the yellow tag seed is required. Um, so just maybe working with your seed vendor and making sure they're aware of that as well. Um, CP42, so as Will mentioned, um, CP42 can be a continuous practice as well, but unlike continuous uh, in the general signup, uh, there is no acreage limit for the CP42. So if you've got a, a big area that you're wanting to convert to pollinator habitat, um, general signup is the way to go. Um, is the seed mix is a 50 point mix. Um, so you're scoring, scoring pretty high. Um, seed mixes can exclusively be your form. So if you're really into the, the really pretty uh, native wildflowers, you could go just strictly wildflowers with this one, or you can, your mix can include um, some native grasses as well. Uh, but with this uh, planting, you will have a higher percentage of forbs in your uh, mix than your grasses. Um, and then uh, something new with this sign-up period, um, there are some incentives that we'll talk about. Um, the C CRP Monarch Initiative uh, incentive is from MDC, um, and this Monarch in, uh, Initiative is geared to really get quality habitat on the ground for monarchs and other pollinators. Um, and it's really, it's focused on those blue highlighted counties. So if you reside in one of those counties um, or your property is in one of those counties, uh, you could be eligible uh, for some of these one-time incentive payments per acres. Um, I do want to note that there are some acre caps um, or dollar amount caps on these. So 
something to be mindful about. Um, but if you are curious and you happen to be in one of those counties, it's always worth asking when you go into your FSA, hey, I think I might be eligible for some incentives. Um, could you tell me about that? Um, and what they'll do is kind of steer you towards an MDC PLC or a QF biologist. Um, and one of us will come out and do a site visit, um, get the planning papers all in order, help you with the application, get all the signatures that you need in order to get that one-time payment for these practices. Um, and something to note that they are offering incentives for prescribed burning and prescribed burn plans um, to have a technical service provider write you a burn plan. So something to, to make note of and definitely ask about if you're in that process of, of getting signed up for general CRP. Um, another uh, incentive is a CRP enhancement incentive. Um, so this is another MDC incentive. So um, you can get a dollar amount for adding these enhancements to your property. Uh, again, this is the, the priority geography area. So kind of hard to read this map. So definitely reach out to one of your QF biologists or MDC PLC. Um, if you think you might be close to or reside in one of those red areas, um, you could get additional uh, incentive money. Um, and there is a maximum and a cap on that one as well. Okay, we're gonna dive into management requirements. Um, so with every conservation plan, there's gonna be required management uh, of your acres. And the purpose of that management is to keep your CRP track in the condition that's providing the best quality habitat throughout the life of the contract, whether it's a 10 year or 15 year contract, you wanna maintain that habitat. Um, with uh, any CRP practice, uh, there's really not any of those practices that you can plant and walk away and expect it to be quality habitat. So um, you're required uh, to provide that, that management um, and we'll kind of dive into different management practices that are acceptable for your CRP. And these can be applicable to um, the continuous and general CRP. Um, disking is uh, a acceptable practice for manage, or for your CRP. Um, the purpose of this is to set back any rank or sod bound grass covering, um, break up that grass, create that bare ground, encourage forb and legume growth um, to create that diverse um, diversity in your stand. Um, I will say one word of caution with disking. Um, some of our invasives really thrive off of disturbance. So, uh, something to keep in mind, um, if you plan on using disking as a management tool, uh, keep an eye on it. And if you see any, any invasives like Cerecia popping up, uh, be ready to treat those. And with that leads into chemical control. That can also be a management practice. Uh, so you can use herbicide to chemically suppress warm or cool season grasses, depending on what your goal is and encourage uh, forb and legume um, growth so that you have the diversity in your stand. Um, impact grazing, uh, this is high stocking rate of livestock for a short period of time. Um, this is a great uh, management tool uh, to create that early succession successional habitat if you've got the proper infrastructure in place. Um, and you can talk with uh, NRCS or a QF uh, biologist um, to see if that could be an option for you. Um, interseeding. So interseeding is not a management practice on its own, uh, but it can be used following another management practice to really enhance the diversity of your stand. If you're noticing um, by the time you get to your management years that you are running into a stand that is becoming just a single species stand, um, you want to maybe address that. So maybe after you do your disking, you can interseed um, with a with a forb mixture, forb or legume mixture to create that diversity in your stand. Um, and lastly, and probably my favorite management uh, practices are prescribed burning. Um, prescribed burning is one of the most cost effective uh, management tools that we have um, to improve habitat, remove thatch or woody encroachment, um, and really encourage some of that for, uh, for development and growth. Um, it's important to remember that with prescribed burning, timing really is everything. So know what your objectives are and what will help you accomplish those goals. So working with um, MDC or a QF biologist and help you get that timing just right. Um, but with this growing interest uh, in, interest in kind of a push to get fire back on Missouri landscapes, um, 
PFQF uh, in partnership with MDC and National Wild Turkey Federation and Missouri Prescribed Fire Council has kind of set out to um, develop these prescribed burn associations or PBAs across the state of Missouri. So um, this is our current map of PBAs in Missouri. Um, we definitely have some in, in works right now, but they're not solidified yet, so they're not on the map. Um, but what a PBA is, it's kind of a, a neighbor helping neighbor approach to prescribed burning. Um, once your PBA is formed, um, members can organize, come together with resources and people power to get prescribed burning done on private lands. I mean, that's really what we want. We want to see prescribed burn, we want to see fire back on Missouri landscape to help um, manage some of these uh, CRPs and other, other acres. Um, if interested, or you think that might be something, an avenue that maybe you want to go down, uh, West Buckeye, he is our prescribed fire coordinating biologist um, here in Missouri. Um, his email is here. Please reach out to him. Um, he works his tail off to get these PBAs up and going, and um, he's awesome. Uh, but you can reach out to him if you're interested in maybe an existing PBA you want to join or you want to develop your own PBA in your counties. Um, or you can uh, go to moprescribedfire.org um, and there's a way to get in contact um, to get a PBA going as well. And of course, you always have your uh, QF biologist reach out to them and they can steer you in the right direction as far as uh, PBAs go. But a very exciting time for prescribed burn in Missouri. And then an important point to make um, uh, is that we, we don't want management practices being conducted between May 1st through July 15th, and that's in all conservation plans and contracts. Um, that is our primary nesting season, and it's um, we don't want disturbance because we want to protect our nesting birds and young wildlife. Um, if you run into an issue where you're struggling with some invasives and um, that window of time is a little bit of a struggle and you, you need to treat, um, you talk, your first step is to go talk to FSA and make sure you get approval to do that. Um, but good rule of thumb, try to get those management practices done outside of that uh, primary nesting season. And again, another reminder, we are currently in the general uh, CRP signup uh, until April 7th. Um, so get into FSA if you're thinking that's an avenue you want to go and continue. It's just, it's ongoing. So if you miss that window, you've got that as an option. Um, and here is an updated PFQF Missouri staff map. So uh, if you scan that QR code, um, that'll get you contact information for our biologists, wetland specialists, coordinating biologists, anybody. Um, so scan that and you can get in touch with uh, somebody near you. And if you're tuning in and you're not from Missouri, um, there's a link down at the bottom to help you find a QF biologist in your area or in your state. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Kim to wrap things up. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Heather and Will, for your awesome presentation. Um, I appreciate you both taking the time to go through all of that. I know that's a lot of information for everybody to kind of um, wrap their heads around. So we mentioned earlier, um, I think at the beginning that we're going to record this. So we're definitely going to provide this recording that'll be available um, for folks to review. Um, like I said, thank you so much, Will and Heather, for your presentation. We appreciate you sharing all that. Um, while you you both were um, talking and presenting, we did have a few questions come in um, from the folks who are um, viewing and watching tonight. So um, we're gonna go over those questions really quick. We're gonna try to answer um, a couple of them live. I know some of you we've um, replied to with um, some text replies, but we do have some live ones. Um, so I'm actually gonna give the first um, question. I'm gonna send this one over to Will. Um, this one came in, It's um, there's a couple parts to it. And the question is, do we need to schedule an appointment with FSA prior to coming to in, into the office? Um, what's the approximate time to get signed up? And then what documents should we bring in with us when we go? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you do not need to schedule an appointment with FSA. Um, the offices are typically open from 8 to 4 30 or 7 to 4 30 or 8 to 5 somewhere in those normal business hours uh, you can go visit with your fsa program technician and they will help you get signed up as far as documents to bring if you have a farm map and you have areas that you know that you would like to enroll in crp that could be handy uh, fsa can also pull up those farm maps as long as you know uh, a farm number or some identifying feature um, and then approximate time to get signed up 
that's going to vary. Um, but as long as you know what you want to do um, and where you want to do it, then it's going to be on FSA to get the offer and get that submitted. Uh, you will have a new CRP plan by the time your contract starts on October 1st, and that is when the plan will go into effect. So I think I hit all, all the parts there. Perfect. Thank you. Well, great answer. Um, all right, we've got another one. Um, this one I'm going to send over to you, Heather. We'll bounce over to you for this one. Um, it says, to enhance the ground nesting birds in the native grass and forb fields, when should it be mowed or control burned? Um, so we typically, and Will, you can chime in too. Um, I'm sure you have a different experience. Um, we typically like those um, I've seen uh, in early early spring, like very early spring is when our, our burn is. Again, it's knowing what your goals are, what you're wanting to kind of set back, what you're wanting to encourage. So um, you're wanting that forb development, you're wanting to burn before the forbs really start to develop and really start to grow. Because if they're actively growing and you hit them with a prescribed burn, you're going to set those, set those back. So hit them early, early in the spring. Um, to kind of remove some thatch um, and that will help get sunlight to the ground and help encourage that forb development. Um, will, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Heather. Um, typically, we want to be burning uh, native warm season grass and forbs in the spring uh, because most commonly your goal is to encourage the growth, growth of those species. Um, within the CRP program, if your ground is enrolled in CRP, there are certain dates that you can burn your CRP. Uh, I believe for cool season grasses, it's March 15th to April 30th or somewhere around there. And then for warm season grasses, it's July 16th until March 15th. Um, so that all that information will be included with your CRP plan. Now, if you do have goals that can't be met by burning in those windows, we do have a little bit of flexibility uh, to adjust that management to help meet your goals. Management is oftentimes very site specific. So if you have a specific situation and would like a second opinion, you can reach out to your local contact and I'm sure they'd be happy to come take a look at it with you. Excellent, thank you guys. All right, I've got another one here. Um, can the CRP contract be canceled or revoked for non-compliance? And is the landowner required to pay back payments? Yeah, so that is um, that's up to the Farm Service Agency. Typically, if you are out of compliance, uh, you do have to remain in compliance for the endurance of the contract. If you are out of compliance, um, FSA is the one that's going to handle that. You'll typically get a notice that you're out of compliance, and, and there will be some time for you to make that right. Uh, very rarely does it go to the landowner making payments back, uh, but that can happen in certain cases. Excellent. Thank you. I've got one more here for you. Let me pull it up here real quick. Give me just a second. All right. Last one for you. I'll probably send this one over to Heather. Um, if I want to burn for management, what is the process to get a burn plan written? Okay. So you've got, you got a couple options. Uh, so um, a PLC, MDC PLC can write you a burn plan. Um, as well as we're starting to get more NRCS uh, staff uh, trained to write uh, burn plans. Um, I will say there is, they ask for a year in advance. So they want you to ask for it a year in advance of when you would need that burn plan. So that's asking a lot and we understand that. Um, and I think that's why MDC came out with some of those uh, incentives. Um, they, there is a specific incentive to, I think it's $400 for a burn plan. Um, and that is to encourage landowners uh, to use the option of finding a technical service provider or TSP um, to write a burn plan for you, which hopefully, ideally, they don't have such a long turnaround time. So a technical service provider can write you a burn plan, um, but I do believe it needs to be a TSP uh, from an approved list that NRCS has. So talk to NRCS about getting that um, TSP list. Um, and you can reach out to um, somebody privately to get that burn plan for you, or again, MDC or and some NRCS staff. And we do have some QF biologists as well that can write burn plans. 
um, for you. So there's a couple of different places you can look for burn plans. Awesome, thank you, Heather. Um, we haven't had any more questions that have come in. Um, so if anybody's got any last couple questions that you've thought about um, and we didn't have a chance to get those answered tonight um, or um, those didn't pop up in the Q&A, um, please do reach out to us. I know obviously we've had Heather and Will um, talking tonight um, on the webinar. I know Heather showed our staff map a little bit ago, um, but we've got biologists all throughout the state uh, who, are, who are there and able to help with these sorts of things. Um, so definitely do reach out to us. Um, as you can see up on the screen right now, there's a ton of ways um, to connect with us, to, to reach out to us and find our information. Um, you can go to our website, that's down there at the bottom, that MissouriPFQF.org. Um, so that's a great place to find our contact information and tons of info about us. Um, I had mentioned earlier um, that we're going to record tonight's um, webinar. We are going to share that. So that's going to be on our Missouri Cool Forever YouTube channel. Um, so you can see that kind of right there in the middle where to find us. Um, we also have some other CRP webinars that we've done the past couple years. Um, you can find those recordings on our YouTube page as well. Um, some of those we talk a little bit more in depth about some of the CRP practices. Um, so if you're looking for more information, reach out to us, check out those webinars. Um, there's lots of different resources out there, but we're happy to help um, facilitate that. Um, so I do want to thank everybody um, for attending us, attending tonight. Thanks to everybody for all of your great questions. Um, like I said, you know where to reach out to us. Um, I do also want to um, send out um, some information or send out a shout out to our partners um, at MDC and over at NRCS and FSA as well. Um, we all work really collaboratively. We all work together on these programs to try to provide assistance for landowners, um, get them enrolled, get the resources that they need. Um, so we work with those partners a lot. Um, you can definitely reach out to MDC um, or FSA or your local USDA office to get help with CRP um, or any other cost share programs and things like that. Um, there's a lot of local resources out there to help you. Um, but if folks do have any other questions, do please um, reach out to us. Like I said, we'll email out the recording to this webinar um, to everybody who is registered. So if you have questions, you can just reply to that email as well um, and we'll get you taken care of. But we hope to hear from everybody. Um, if there's anything we can do to help with CRP or just habitat management in general, um, our staff are, are happy and willing to help. So just let us know if we can. Um, but that's all for this evening. Thanks again for um, attending everybody. Thanks to Heather and Will for presenting for us. Um, and we hope to hear from folks soon about CRP. Thanks everybody. Have a good night.